Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon sessions. Um, technical talk today. Uh, the next sessions we have is uh, let's see. <laughs> it's entitled Earth Thermally Conductive at the end at and hence for next generation cell to play configurations. Our speaker today is Tom, F Dr. F uh, Tim Foyles. Foyles yeah. uh, Tim is the, uh, Dr. Dr. Foyles is a, a technical fellow in the advanced technology development for of Parker and Lord, Parker and Lord uh, cooperations. I joined on Lord in 2005 and has been focusing on creating new and hence and coding product for techno and technology that is com relevant to electronics, aer aerospace, and automotive industry. Um, so the work that he has done is on a thermal conducti conductive adhesive and portal for EV coolant, charger, battery pack, electric motor, uh, and, and several other um, materials. Um, uh, Tim also has like co authored around the 19 review, peer review technical paper and co-vented a number of P US and international patents. Uh, he's, he's the found ch chef, founding chair of the SAE International U U Commi International Committee for Adhesive Silence and Heat Transfer Material for Paris Systems. Uh, before joining Lord, uh, Tim has here a postdoctoral position at MIT uh, for uh, Institutes of Soldier and Land and Technology and uh, also and, uh, was a global process development engineer for Potter and Campbell Company. Uh, he, also, he, he holds a, a chemical engineering degree, Bachelor of Home Engineering, Chemical Engineering from um, um, North Carolina State, and a Master and, and PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Texas in Austin. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice introduction, Wellington. I get a little nauseous when people talk too much about me, so if I dry heave in front of you, you understand. I don't like too much attention up here, but speaking of attention, this is what I'll be presenting about today. We're doing a lot of good work at Lord Parker Lord, uh, trying to align with next generation technologies, where the EV market's going. And uh, battery design is ever, it's ever changing. And we know that, and it's changing to what is now called cell to pack configuration. So, I'm going to share with you some exciting work that we've been doing with thermally conductive materials, thermally conductive adhesives, to really align with this market trend uh, that's, that's really emerging uh, strongly. Now, before I do that, I'm obligated from a job security standpoint uh, to say a few things about the company that I work for, because I do have some very important business people in the audience that would actually kill me if I didn't say anything about Parker Lord. They're giving me a nice smile. But in all seriousness, um, who is Parker Lord? Well, Parker Lord really specializes in adhesive and emotion control technologies. Uh, we're some of the world leaders in, it, in those two categories. And when it comes to adhesives, we're very good at thermal management materials. Uh, we are, we, I would say we are world leaders there too. And uh, we specialize in a variety of chemistries. These chemistries range from silicones to urethanes, acrylics, and epoxies. But what, what we're also really good at is teaming up with customers and solving tough problems. These could be niche problems or ubiquitous problems. And it's that combination of technical expertise as well as the ability to solve problems that prompted this bigger company called Parker Hannafin to acquire us about two years ago. So that's why we're called Parker Lord. And we've developed a really nice synergism between our two companies. And that synergism uh, involves many business centers across the world, many technical centers, and manufacturing facilities. So we've got a great breadth and depth of technical expertise and business expertise. Speaking of expertise, and we're at the EV conference, let's talk about some of our electrification solutions. These solutions span the EV uh, vehicle from headlight to taillight. And so we've developed a variety of different, we have developed a variety of different products. These include things like pottons. Oops, I actually meant to hit the, uh, let's go backwards. Come on, there we go. We uh, have potting compounds, thermally conductive gap fillers. We have structural adhesives. 
We have coding applications or coding products for dielectric coatings as well as flame retardant coatings. And these serve purposes both on the vehicle and outside the vehicle. So the previous presenter presented a lot about uh, outboard and onboard chargers. And so we developed a lot of technology to sell, help solve these onboard charging uh, uh, needs, especially with, with heat management. Actually, we should probably team up after the, the talk and, and tell him, at least for, for, the, for the Lord folks, we should tell him uh, how to address some of his thermal management issues. So if you want to learn more about our technologies, check our booth out. It's 1211. There you can uh, ask as many questions as, you, as your heart desires, and we'll do our best to answer those and point you to the right uh, products and technologies that can meet your needs. So now that I'm done with the technical stuff, I mean business stuff, let's talk technical. Uh, this is what I hope to cover today with you. I'll start out with the motivation behind this trend for cell to pack battery configurations. Why are we developing these new thermally conductive adhesives? And I'll talk about specifically some of the implications related to thermal management with this shift to cell to pack designs. And from those implica implications, there's a lot of challenges. A lot of challenges that I'll highlight. And then from those challenges, I'll show you a nice case study in which we develop these next generation cell to pack adhesives to address those challenges. And we compare and contrast those to conventional cell, uh, conventional gap fillers that are used in modular-like structures or modular battery packs. And then lastly, I'll finish up with some conclusions, and I'll briefly mention some of the future studies that we're working on at Parker Lord to address not only additional cell-to-pack needs, but future needs like with cell-to-chastity, uh, chassis, Actually, I have a niece called Chastity who I'm actually going to visit in about an hour. So if I say Chastity, that's the reason why. I haven't seen her in a year and a half. Uh, this COVID situation's been pretty bummer. Anyway, cell to chassis type work is part of our future work. So, um, so this slide really gives you a nice summary of the current modular design. I think we're all very familiar with this type of design. It consists of individual, individual boxes, um, uh, of, of arrays of batteries. These batteries can be in all sorts of form factors. They can be prismatic, they can be pouch, or they can be cell type structures. But we know that there are a lot of individual batteries that make up these housings, and these, there's a number of housings that make up the battery pack. And these can vary in, in great numbers depending upon the size of the vehicle and the range of the vehicle. Um, these housings provide a lot of protection. They have a specific enclosure that encloses those, those array of batteries. In addition, there's the extra enclosure of the battery lid that provides lots of nice protection. Now, this is not the only advent, ad, advantage of these cell to pack, or uh, these modular based systems. This next slide really highlights some of the key advantages. Uh, so you have discrete control over the modules. You've got a lot of work over the years uh, from a variety of OEMs to be able to integrate technologies into these individual modules, including like health monitoring. Um, health monitoring is very important. If you have a defective battery module, then maybe you might want to service it. Well, the modular approach gives you that kind of plug and play um, capability to, to allow you to easily service or remove that battery module and put a new one in uh, uh, and, and off you go. Um, as I previously mentioned uh, in the last slide, that you have an enclosure with these modules, this, this housing. The housing provides extra protection, extra protection from crash protection, uh, electrical isolation to prevent any electrical uh, maybe arcing from one module to the next. And so you have all these benefits. And we know with technology, there's always a change, right? There's always a reason for getting better. And these reasons are really shown here below. These are the cons of the, of the modular approach. Thermal management, we have kind of like a pro and con, but ma thermal management can be rather cumbersome uh, given you have to have multiple materials. Um, lightweight is an issue. If you have all these individual housings and the ancillary components like wires and bus bars, connectors, they take up a lot of weight, they take up a lot of space, and so it's not that efficient, right? 
Um, speaking of efficient, the packed energy density can be compromised with this dead space. In addition, part count is very high since you have all these other ancillary parts. And in, com in combination with all these different things, with this multi-step approach where you take batteries and insert them into housings and housings insert them into the battery packs themselves comes a lot of complexity. And we know that complexity equates to cost, so higher cost. So really, this is the impetus for what we're doing at Parker Lord to, to develop cell-to-pack cell uh, type adhesives. And this next slide really shows that shift uh, in mentality that OEMs are moving towards. So they're, they're going from the modular structure that's shown on the left, um, right here, to the simple cell-to-pack structure. And this is kind of a generic, uh, uh, a generic diagram that we put together. But what you can see here is that you're really packing many more modules in the same amount of space and you're getting rid of all, all that, you know, that dead space associated with the module housing and all the extra wiring. And so there's a lot of benefits for this, which, which is the, you know, the opposite of the cons that I just shared with you on the previous slide. But a, a lot of OEMs are already showing that you can get dramatic, dramatic improvements in things like lower part count. There's been studies published um, by uh, companies like CATL, for example, where you get as much as of a 40% reduction in total part count by going from the modular approach to the cell, cell to pack approach. When it comes to energy density, the volumetric cell to pack ratios jump up quite a bit. There have been reports as much as a 50% improvement in that, type, in that number. And if you, if you attended Bob Galen's talk, uh, at the, or his introductory talk, he was quoting numbers as high as, as what, 92 or 96 percent um, um, volumetric cell to pack ratio. Uh, that's pretty impressive. I think I need to see that <laughs> in person. But you can, you can begin to appreciate um, this, this, this desire to move to this, this, this new configuration. Um, there's some other things that come with that, obviously with, with, with less a number of parts, you've got simplified manufacturability, and like I said, lower cost can come with it. I'd also like to talk about simplified and less stringent thermal management. So there's a number of implications associated with this shift, and we need to pay attention to those. So I don't know if all of you are familiar with thermal management of uh, the current uh, modular-based approach. I'm assuming some of you don't. So I'll put this slide together to give you a nice overview of where the technology stands. And, this, and what we're looking at here on the left side is the, is the basic module. And it consists of the battery cell that's adhered to a module housing using a thermally conductive gap filler. The gap filler kind of ju does just that. It fills a lot of gaps. It fills the spaces between the cells and between the batteries and the cooling plate. And that allows you to have a continuous thermal pathway through which heat can travel that can and obviously help ma manage the temperature uh, that your batteries operate. But at the same time, it acts as a, an adhesive to firmly mechanically bond the two entities together. Um, below this housing is another thermal management material. It's a thermally conductive gap filler as well. It not only serves to, um, to occupy space, but it allows you to kind of dampen vibrations in your application. So it's a lightly cross-linked material with low modulus, typically high elongation. And uh, it also has some other properties that, um, that I'll talk about here on the right. But this gap filler, by the way, marries up against the cooling plate. Um, so on the right side, it's kind of a summary of these two upper and lower gap fillers. I'm going to refer them to uh, refer to them as the cell to module gap filler and the module to plate. So this CTM type and MT, MTP gap filler. Um, so for the upper gap filler, it's designed to firmly adhere the battery cells to that module housing. And it typically consists of a thermally conductive urethane. Now, why urethanes? Urethanes have a really nice balance of mechanical properties. They have good uh, elongation at break, good ductility. They have, you can design them to have high modulus. You can also design them to have low modulus. But they also are good at adhering to a variety of different substrates. For the lower gap filler, uh, these are designed, as I mentioned, to, to be uh, lightly cross-linked. 
that means they need to lightly adhere to the lower cooling plate. And it goes back to the serviceability of those modules. They need to be readily um, um, serviceable where you can delaminate or pull that module off, scrape off the, the gap filler, uh, put on some new gap filler, and then put in your new module. So it has to have a precious balance of good adhesion, but not so good of adhesion so you can actually rework it. Uh, these materials are often thermally conductive silicones, at least in our laboratories, as well as urethanes. Uh, for the similar reasons as I mentioned above, uh, that they can be designed to have, you know, good, good mechanical properties, good elongation. I should also point out we have new technology that we're developing, soon to be released, as one-part adhesives that are non-silicone, non-isocyanates. What I didn't mention is all of these chemistries here are, are, are two-part types uh, of adhesives or gap fillers. We have a variety of information at our booth if you want to learn more about our products. Uh, we've done a great job of developing various products for these specific applications that can meet your current modular needs. So check it out if you're interested in that. Another business plug, and I'm going to get a raise at the end of this talk, right, guys? Uh, okay. All right. So if you compare uh, the modular approach to that of the cell to pack approach, it's quite different. It's much simpler, obviously. You've now eliminated a thermal interface material and you're directly bonding, you're directly bonding a thermally conductive adhesive to a cooling plate. And notice that I use the word adhesive. Um, in fact, the materials that we're developing today, and you might have seen this in some other talks. Uh, one talk was given yesterday from, uh, from our, our, our Dow friends, our, our du actually DuPont friends. Um, what sh they showed in their talk, just like we're showing in our talk, is there's a shift to going to more rigid type materials. In fact, we're developing almost like structural adhesives that happen to be thermally conductive. And so you need this adhesive, uh, high adhesive strength to survive some of the more stringent environments that you're exposed to since you no longer have the module housing that you once had in that modular approach. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the, the key needs related to adhesion in a second. Um, so I think I've already, already made this statement. It strongly adheres to the lower portion of batteries to the cooling plate. We're also using urethane chemistry uh, to solve this kind of problem. So urethane chemistry, again, is versatile. You can design it to have high glass transition temperatures, low grass, glass transition temperatures, and you can use it to, use it to bond to a variety of, of difficult to bond to substrates. So I just gave you kind of a qualitative overview of uh, the differences between the modular and cell, cell to pack thermal management systems. I now like to go into kind of more of a quantitative comparison between the two. And what you can see here is different stacks uh, of, of, of different materials that represent the overall bond line that you would expect to see in a modular system versus, or versus a cell to pack system. And so on the left you can see well, we have the battery, we have the two types of gap fillers that sandwich the housing and then the lower cooling plate. And then on the right, we have the very simple system with the battery cell to plate adhesive and the cooling plate. Um, when you're talking about thermal management, um, and if you're versed in this area, you often talk about resistance or impedance. Uh, impedance uh, is kind of a fancy word for resistance. I kind of won't, I won't go into the technical details of that, but think about resistance being a bad thing when it comes to heat transfer. You don't want high levels of resi resistance. You want very low levels of resistance such that the temperature of your batteries is pretty much matching that of your cooling plate. And so that lower that number is, the closer that, um, that temperature of the battery will be to that of the cooling plate. You can see on the left-hand side, um, or actually in the middle of this diagram, there are different types of terms. And these terms can be broken up into two different types of, of impedance. There's your interfacial impedance, and there's your bulk impedance. So when a thermal phonon, a heat is going through a stack of materials, and then it counters an interface, it hates that. It hates the change in density. It hates the change in the atomic orientation 
of the different structures of those materials. And, it, and, and what happens is there's a thermal penalty. You basically get some kind of heat buildup. It's an inefficiency. And that's what represents the thermal impedance. The other part of the, the overall impedance equation is this term called bulk impedance. And bulk impedance is simply the thickness of the material. The thicker the material, the bigger the resistance, right? If you have phonons or heat going through that material as well as the conductivity of that material. So if you have a highly conductive material, it's easier for that heat to transfer through there. And so the bulk, bulk impedance is simply the ratio of those two terms. And so now let's get back to this comparison. If you add up all these terms, you can see there's just a buku of terms here on the bottom, right? You have four interfacial impedances and three bulk impedances. In contrast, you only have one, inter, uh, one bulk impedance and two interfacial impedance. So you can already see there is a quantitative motivation to move to this type of design. Now, me being a kind of a nerd, wanted to, I wanted to better understand the difference is in, in, in the numbers that you would expect to get if you plug in representative values for the interfacial impedance as well as the bulk impedance. And so I did that, and I did that using um, some numbers that I generated a, a, a couple years ago from a study involving comparing liquid dispense gap fillers to that of gap pads. And we generated a lot of good data there where we could get interfacial impedance values and bulk values. And I, I used that here in this study and plugged the numbers in for the different types of materials that are involved. And so the gap filler, the gap filler um, over here, the CELTA module gap filler, is generally around three watts per meter, watts per meter Kelvin um, in, in industry. It might vary two to three watts, but most of the, uh, the automobile manufacturers want a material in this type of range. The nominal thickness, bond line thickness, can be around three millimeters or 0.3 centimeters. The lower gap filler, the MTP gap filler, is typically around two watts per meter Kelvin. So I'll plug this number into my equation as well as a similar bond line thickness. And then I chose a, a module housing of about four millimeters. That's based on aluminum. That, that, the conductivity of aluminum is about 247 watts per meter Kelvin. And so if you add all these numbers up, you get an interfacial impedance of about 31 Kelvin centimeters squared per watt. Now, if you kind of do the same thing for the cell to pack design um, and incorporate a conductivity intermediate to that of those upper and lower gap fillers from that modular approach, which is 2.5 watts. Oh, I went one, one slide ahead. Oh, let me go back. There we go. Oops, uh, I stole some of my own thunder. Um, if you put 2.5 watts in for that, um, that material and the same bond line thickness, you'll notice that the difference in total impedance is half of that for the cell to pack design to that of the modular design. So that's a huge difference. And you can imagine uh, OEMs are quite excited about having something that, that generates less heat uh, that, because they can now use the, the, they can now not have as much energy devoted to cooling those batteries, waste, in some ways wasted energy. Now, some OEMs want to design a material to have the same overall uh, resistance uh, between the battery and the cooling plate. So what I, what I did in these calculations is I equated the, the overall resistance and back calculated the type of thermal conductivity that I need to have that same resistance. And this is where that next slide comes into play. So if you back calculate, oh, See, there's, I have to tell you, there's two green buttons. One's for the laser and one's for the advancer. And so when you look at green, you want to hit the laser or the advancer. Anyway, I apologize for going back and forth. Let me move back. I'm trying to get back. There we go. Sorry about that, everyone. So if you back calculate the conductivity you need, you need nominally about one watt per meter Kelvin. And so th these are the kind of numbers that uh, OEMs are asking for for these new cell to plate designs anywhere from maybe one to maybe as much as two watts per meter Kelvin. And so that kind of gives you a quantitative reason as to why OEMs are moving in that direction. So I've 
Thus far, I've painted a pretty rosy picture of this cell-to-pack design. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of concerns that OEMs have with this movement. There's big challenges. Battery serviceability is one. Um, how do you get these, these, these batteries out and potentially recycling them? My understanding from going to other talks is I think they're just gonna grind these things up and uh, let somebody else deal with them. Um, thermal runaway is an even probably bigger concern because you no longer have the module housing to pe protect you from uh, propagation of fire from, from one module to the next. All these batteries are completely exposed. This is very similar to environmental protection and mechanical integrity and crash re resistance. You don't have that module housing to protect you. Some other things to take into consideration is that a lot of companies are changing their battery uh, dimensions. They're going to much larger batteries. And so this brings a, in a whole new can of worms that you have to deal with. And so there, there are a number of challenges. From a thermal management standpoint, here are some of the challenges that we're faced with in, in our particular subset of the market. And they're listed right here uh, on this particular slide. Low density is a really important one. So OEMs are pushing us to go to lower and lower density. And the reason, one of the reasons being is simply light weighting. Now density numbers are getting close to about two grams per centimeter cube for the type of requirements that we're trying to hit. Thermal conductivity, as I mentioned, it needs to be in that maybe one to two uh, watts per meter Kelvin range. It might not sound much, but when you're trying to provide a customer uh, with cake and let them eat it too, uh, <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to meet all these different requirements as well as have you know, decent conductivity. Now probably the most stringent requirement that we've encountered is a combination of high adhesive strength in the presence of more and more st or stricter or harsher and harsher environmental conditions. So OEMs are pushing these, these requirements to higher and higher temperatures and higher humidity and for longer periods of time. So it's not uncommon now that we have to have adhesives that to be, have to be highly uh, adhering uh, over six weeks of aging. Now in terms of actual mechanical loads, these are getting into the structural load kind of regimes. You need to get as much as maybe six megapascals or even double that in terms of something like lap shear strength. And not only do you have to do that, but you have to do it on very difficult to bond substrates like plastics. And probably the most common plastics that's used to at least enshroud the batteries that we have to bond to is polyethylene terephthalate, which uh, is, is, is nicknamed PET. It's, uh, we've tested a lot of PETs uh, over the course of our time at Lord Corporation, including pa Pomeranians. But you know, I hope there are no people in the audience that have a Pomeranian. Can you folks laugh a little bit? You're a little stiff, thank you. Anyway, uh, so difficult to bond substrates like plastics make these requirements really, really, really difficult. Um, and then there's one, this one last requirement. It might be a little bit of a hybrid requirement, requirement but we found that some uh, manufacturers are wanting low dielectric constant. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about why they want low dielectric constant and how we're, we're solving that, that need. So let's talk about some of the developmental efforts that we're doing to address these various challenges. So I mentioned uh, at the, the start of the talk, we did a case study. And the case study involved comparing two different adhesives. One adhesive was that cell-to-module adhesive. It's a polyurethane-based adhesive. It's based on the same types of chemistries that we worked on several years to develop the type of products that I mentioned that we currently have at our booth, booth 1211, if you want to go there. Um, we, we took those types of chemistries and compared them to some of the new proprietary chemistries that we've developed in our laboratories for bonding cell-to-pack that have some of the different requirements than that of the modular-based systems. These materials are room temperature cure materials and they have a nominal conductivity of about 1.5 watts per meter Kelvin. Now in addition to some of the comparisons that I make between these two adhesives, I'm going to touch on some, uh, some extra properties that we've characterized for the cell to pack adhesives, important properties to EV manufacturers. Properties like viscosity, conductivity, tensile properties, and, uh, and dielectric constant. 
So let's talk data. We have lots of good data to share with you. Uh, we pride ourselves in some of the technical work that we do, so this is not explicitly a, mar a marketing presentation. Uh, in this slide right here, this is a plot of lap shear strength versus 85 degrees C, 85% relative humidity aging time in terms of hours. And what you can see in this slide is that the traditional gap filler that's designed for modular-based structures cannot hold up under these stringent environments. It rapidly drops in adhesion and then levels off to numbers of around three megapascals. Now, these numbers are still quite good and plenty good enough to, su to survive some of the, the conditions that, that they're exposed to uh, inside the module. Now, putting them outside the module, they're just not good enough, hence the reason we develop new chemistries. And that cell-to-pack adhesive is really flat versus time. It maintains adhesions, adhesion levels in the vicinity of 11 to 12, 12 megapascals during their entire test. Um, if you look at the failure modes for these materials, they really nice, give you a nice qualitative image or quantitative, qualitative image of those quantitative results. What you see here on the left side is the f failure modes for the cell to gap filler, um, a cell to module gap filler adhesive. At time equals zero, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. At time, let's go back. At time equals zero, no aging. You kind of have a mixed failure mode. You have cohesive type failure of the adhesive as well as some adhesive failure to the aluminum substrate. When you age these and subject them to high levels of humidity and heat, you start seeing um, um, a change in the failure mode where you now have an adhesive type failure uh, of the material to the aluminum. In contrast, if you look at the failure modes for the cell to pack adhesive, they're, they're, they're beautiful. <laughs> they're, um, the failure mode is a nice cohesive failure. Uh, you're breaking the material itself rather than the interface. And this pretty much stays put through the entire thousand hours or six weeks of stringent or strict uh, aging conditions. So again, this, this helps to explain the good, good performance. Now shifting gears slightly, we also tested uh, the adhesion in a hybrid type scenario because customers want us to bond up against, a, against that polyethylene terephthalate. So uh, in this case, you can see on the right, we inserted our PET film in the middle of the bond line, applied adhesive on top and bottom of that film, and then adhered those aluminum substrates, and then conducted our lap shear test. You can see the results are quite similar as the previous results. The cell to pack adhesive does a much better job in maintaining high levels of adhesion over that course of the 8580, 85. 80 degrees C uh, aging uh, conditions. However, the cell to module gap filler again starts to drop off in a short period of time, but still levels out in that same three megapas megapascal vicinity. Um, the, uh, the failure modes for these different materials are shown in this next slide. They're somewhat similar to what you saw in, in, the, in, the, in the previous failure mode slide. But in this case, we have the PET in the bond line. And I should point out the PET here is a clear PET that we use, so it's a little difficult for probably you folks to see. But for at time equals zero with no aging, you can see a mixed failure mode. You can have cohesive failure of the adhesive. You have a little tearing of the PET itself, as well as some delamination of the adhesive on the pure aluminum. Uh, similarly uh, to the past test on straight aluminum aluminum, the adhesive delaminates uh, from the aluminum substrate. But with this new cell to pack design, we see once again very attractive um, failure modes. We see not only cohesive failure of the adhesive, but we see lots of PE tearing. This is seen here with these kind of jagged edges that you see on top of that, uh, on top of that substrate. And then as you heat these and, and, and expose them to humidity over long, longer periods of time, we do see some transition to um, an adhesive failure mode against that of the PET. Um, now I should emphasize, we're still getting very good adhesion numbers of about seven megapascals, but if you're a scientist that 
that wants to, you know, strive for perfection, you try to figure out different ways to make things even better. And one thing that we attempted to do is we attempted to plasma treat the PET to uh, help with uh, a number of things. One, we wanted to potentially help with the wetting of the adhesive onto uh, the, the PET substrate. And by plasma treating, you can affect the, um, the energy, uh, the surface energy of these materials. You can increase the surface energy and allow the, the adhesive to better wet out onto the substrate. And that's illustrated here with water contact angles going from 75 degrees to 25 degrees. You get better wetting. But the, another thing that plasma technology allows you to, you to do is to generate functional moieties that, that isocyanates, which are one facet of the urethanes, isocyanates can now bond to. And so these kind of moieties or chemical structures like uh, carboxylic acid groups or hydroxyl groups can now allow you to, to bond in to that, um, into that polyethylene terephthalate that's been modified. I included the structure of PET here just for reference. This is a polymer. Films have high molecular weight. And so most of the PET comprises this internal structure. And that internal structure has none of those, those groups that you can really bond to. It does have the end groups that you can react your isocyanate to, but they're not, they're not that many since you have a high molecular weight material. I should also point out that the polyethylene terephthalate is a is a, um, an ester, an ester linkage, and that kind of ties into my next slide. So you're probably expecting like super whiz bang improvements um, um, in, in this experiment, but we didn't see that at all, and you, you might wonder why. Um, if you look at the plot here on the left, this is the, the sandwich structure again, the aluminum PET, aluminum structure as a function of aging time. The red line has no plasma on the PET. Uh, the green line has the plasma-treated PET. They're pretty much identical. And the more you think about this, um, it likely is rooted, if I go back, if this pointer or clicker will work, if you go back to this PET, being an ester, esters are not really that great at surviving high levels of heat and humidity. They're prone to hydrolysis. So some of the uh, degradation in performance is in fact attributed to the polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate film that OEMs are using. And so a lot of OEMs are not really that versed in chemistry because they're mechanical engineers, they're electrical engineers. So they need to look, at some t in some cases, to shifting their types of, of plastics that they're using if they're going to require uh, companies like us to pass 85-85 types of aging. Um, Another thing, uh, if there's anyone in the audience, another thing that's really puzzled me, I'd love to have this conversation, is that some of the adhesion requirements given to us by our customers are far greater than the level of adhesion that the PET has against the battery substrate itself. So these things are often adhered to by pressure sensitive adhesives. So sometimes it's a little silly for an OEM to say, give me the structural adhesive requirement when the stinking PET won't even adhere that well to the, P to the battery itself. So anyway, um, I digress a little bit. So. Um, there's not much to say here in terms of failure modes because the quantitative results are identical. The, the failure modes for these two adhesives were also identical despite uh, the, the, the plasma treatment exposure. Let's talk a little bit different work here, still in, in terms of aging. We wanted to determine that, our, um, that, 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 that those phonons can still go through that bond line after you age age the, um, the adhesives or the specimens uh, at 85-85. And so this plot right here is a plot of, again, thermal impedance um, that I mentioned earlier. This is a, a combination of interfacial impedance and bulk impedance, as you can see here on the bottom. So we measured um, the impedance. In fact, Tim measured the impedance on a Tim tester 10 times a day tenaciously. All right. Can I get one laugh, please? One? Okay. I was hoping Jim Gregg would be here. He always teases me. He's my colleague. He said, can you t do the Tim Tester joke? But I guess that went over like a Led Zeppelin. Uh, anyway, you can see here the thermal impedance is pretty much flat with time. 
which is a good thing for, for us, uh, regardless of the different application. So this uh, different application being modular versus cell to pack. Um, so this really tells you that there's no difference in the, the, the heat transfer across the bond line uh, after you age these materials. Um, some of you might have expected that the modular-based adhesive would have puttered out. Um, this test is quite different than a lap shear test. You're not putting super high loads onto that test, and so that's one reason you don't see any difference. Nevertheless, the level of adhesion at three megapascals is really strong, uh, and it gives you nice uh, interfacial impedance as a function of environmental, um, environmental exposure. So this slide, share, this slide summarizes some critical EV bulk properties for that cell to pack design that uh, I think hopefully some of you would find interesting. Like I mentioned, we have a conductivity, anomaly 1.5, it's a little bit greater than that. We typically at Lord Corporation, we want to design our adhesives to be a little bit above the requirement so the OEMs don't get really mad at us if we ever dip below the spec. Um, we can design these materials to have high glass transition temperature. In this case, it's anomaly around 53 degrees. So you can have materials that retain high strength even when you heat them at the upper limits of the battery, uh, the battery usage temperature um, that OEMs uh, specify. Viscosity is an immensely important item. Viscosity needs to have the right balance of, um, or it needs to have the right shear thinning profile. Why do you need a shear thinning material? Well, when you're pumping this stuff out of a meter mixed dispense system, it has to have really low viscosity for high throughput. But when it arrives on the part, it needs to stay put. It needs to have good sag resistance. So you typically want a profile that looks like this. As you go to higher shear rates, it heavily shear thins and makes it, makes it easier to dispense. But when you remove that shear, it stays put. Some other important things, density. So we're below that, you know, that, that current target of two grams per centimeter cube. Keep in mind these materials are typically highly filled and it's, it's pretty difficult to have a balance of something that has a ton of filler in it as, also, as well as polymeric type properties. Speaking of polymeric properties, we have good combination of, of bulk properties of, of tensile strength and elongation at break, not only to absorb mechanical loads that are put on the part, but loads that, uh, that you deal with with CTE mismatches when you're going through things like thermal, thermal cycling. So the last, the last kind of bulk property that I want to talk about is low dielectric constant. So why do you need this? And my understanding of this uh, need is somewhat primitive, so I apologize if it doesn't make entire sense to you, and I would welcome any electrical engineers to come talk to me afterwards. But based on my uh, limited conversations with OEMs, is they want materials with low dielectric constant is because the reason being is that if you have these battery packs in the vicinity of, um, of electrical circuits that are generating charges, that you can have some crosstalk between that circuit and, the, and the, the conductive cooling plate. So you can induce currents inside that cooling plate. And when you're inducing currents, it can build up charge. And what happens is the CT cell to, to pack adhesive can actually act like a capacitor. And this can be a bad thing if you're building up enough charge where some poor person, <laughs> some poor sap, goes to touch the cooling plate and all that charge is released through that poor person's body and they, they can actually get zapped and that can be quite dangerous. We certainly don't want to provide technology that potentially does that. Now, it's not entirely clear if the entire industry is moving in this direction. Um, but I, I, again, I welcome anyone that has great knowledge of this particular need to come talk to me because I want to better understand it. Nevertheless, we've done a lot of measurements in our laboratories to try to develop materials that have low capacitance. For those of you that are not f familiar with capacitance, I've put the equations here. In essence, you're measuring the permittivity of the material for a given geometry and you're doing that relative that to uh, the permittivity of, of vacuum. You take the ratio of those two permittivities and you have the dielectric constant. The way we measure that is we're using this 
precision uh, LCR meter and with a particular te test fixture where we can squeeze the material to the same types of bond lines that we might test at. And then we can uh, vary the frequency and measure the, uh, the dielectric constant. And what you see with this particular prototype is that we're able to get dielectric constant values of around six to uh, below five. And these are very relatively low values. Most of the adhesives or gap fillers that you see on the market these days are up in the seven, maybe as high as eight um, um, dielectric constant value. Now, I should very uh, emphasize that these materials, th these materials that we're working on are somewhat developmental. It, maybe a better way of saying it is we, we have the versatility to change the properties of these adhesives and give you even lower dielectric constant if you need that. So please come talk to us if, if you have a culmination of needs, including this dielectric constant, and we, we can, we can uh, do that. All right, next slide. I think this really brings us to the conclusion of my talk. I'm pretty much almost out of time. I, th I see the double zero here. If there's anything that you can walk away with, I hope it's this that our new CELTA pack adhesive technology delivers a number of things. It delivers high strength in the presence of very rigorous uh, environmental uh, uh, exposure, like that 85-85 type of exposure. We can deliver materials that not only have good uh, adhesive strength, but have high thermal conductivity to help manage heat, low density for light weighting, and low si safe electric dielectric constant uh, to protect people from some misfortunate discharge event uh, at the OEM or maybe even uh, at, at the dealership. Um, ultimately, the value that we create cr provides value to our customers, and that value really translates to this, this value to the move to the cell to pack design. We can enable low part, low part count, lighter weight, simplified thermal management, higher energy density, and, and improved manufacturability. And everyone loves lower cost, of course. So, um, some future work that we're, we're doing, we're developing our chemistries for more enhanced performance. We're looking at different types of substrates that, uh, that OEMs want us to bond to. Not everyone wants straight up aluminum. They want E-coated aluminum. So we already have good high adhesion values on E-coated aluminum. And then we're even thinking ahead to, to chassis, cell, I'm gonna say chassis again, cell to chassis type configurations. So if you're integrating batteries into the structural elements of a car, we need to think about crash protection. So the word structural adhes adhesive or the words structural adhesives are only going to be more important. Lastly, I want to thank you for attending, and I also want to thank two bright young stars that I work with uh, at Parker Lore. This is Susan Donaldson and Craig Turner. They worked a hell of a lot to provide a lot of the data that, that I had the pleasure of presenting, and I had the pleasure of m mentoring these two people. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have a, a really nice talk that maybe uh, you could hopefully enjoy, including my jokes. So I appreciate you uh, attending, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have in this forum or outside of this forum at our booth. I'll be at the booth tomorrow. I can stick around here if you want to send me an email if you don't like to talk to nerds. Um, and then lastly, check out a white paper. We just published a white paper on, on this talk, uh, on this technology. You can learn even more. So again, thank you, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. Oh, great, one question. If you give us a minute, I think the person's coming with the mic. Yeah, you mentioned that you had some adhesives that were both uh, non-silicone and no, uh, no isocyanates. Yep. And then you talked in the study about needing groups that the isocyanates could bond to. So was that a, was that a separate adhesive you were talking about? Yes, that, that was a separate separate adhesive. Okay. So we certainly recognize there's there's some customers that don't like to use silicones. Uh, one of the reasons being is silicones can uh, interfere with the paint operations and other parts of their plant. Uh, silicones can also have uh, low, uh, residuals of cyclic monomers, uh, and those cyclic monomers can be, in some cases, volatile if you heat the part up. 
and those monomers can condense down onto electrical relays and cause shorting. Now for us, uh, we have materials that have low cyclic monomer content for silicones. Now if you, can, if you flip over to urethanes, uh, certain countries don't like handle, uh, using isocyanates because uh, certain types of isocyanates can react with your skin, they can pose health problems. We're very cognizant of that when we develop our adhesives, so we want to have the, the best EH&S labels on, uh, on the products that we have when we ship them out. Um, but even at that, some people want entirely uh, no isocyanates at all, at all, especially in the future uh, when, you know, the regulations are only getting stricter and stricter. So we do have technology that involves non-isocyanate, non-silicone chemistry, but it's also one part, uh, a one-part solution, which obviously brings the benefits of, uh, you know, the manufacturability of that material. Thank does you. that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank I you. know that was a little long-winded, but uh, I, I wanted to explain myself from a variety of different standpoints. <laughs> well done. Any other questions? What time do we have? I know when you're making uh, this into more of a structural adhesive, you'll typically drop the elongation, but that's really low. Have you gotten any feedback on whether that's ex an acceptable that 12% or not, or whether it needs to be a little bit higher? And then the second question I had was on the, the one part. Is that going to be a, some kind of room temperature or thermal cure, or how, how are you going to cure that material? Okay, so the first answer to your question, uh, which is a great question. I have that same question for some of the, the, the customers that I interact with. Yes and no. Um, we've had some customers um, that, that, that actually have done some design work where they're saying, well, you don't, you don't need these kind of levels that maybe I presented at. Other customers, unfortunately, are taking a structural adhesive that they find off the shelf that works great and say, hey, we want you to, to have these properties, but one and a half watts per meter Kelvin. Can you give us both? And so, you know, we've been in every market with customers, or you've been in, the customer's always right is what I'm trying to say. And so um, we try to, try to address those needs, but at the same time, we're doing additional experiments to kind of teach them about their own technology. So we're in the middle of doing that right now. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. We've seen, again, some dramatic differences in those needs. Um, this, the second uh, question was regarding the one part material. That is a room temperature uh, curing material. Yes, it does not require heat. Thanks. Well, You're welcome. Hey, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Hi, this is Manjit from Momentive. We are a silicon producer. It's good to hear about uh, silicons yeah. not being used in automotive. That's an interesting perspective. My question to your adhesive system, is there a VOC limit that you're going after or I, I, VOC? I, I, oh, VOC. Uh, your question about VOC, I'm sorry? Do you, are you, do you have any specification on the VOC side? As you, do? Uh, you know, that, no, no specification on the VOC side. We haven't had any issues. I mean, depending upon the chemistries that you use when you formulate, um, you know, volatility may be a concern, but we're very cognizant of having higher molecular weight type of resins that, that are not going to volatilize even with decent amounts of heat. Probably the bigger concern that we have was when we formulate these materials at our manufacturing facilities and we're mixing these under heat and vacuum. With the high levels of vacuum, we, want, we don't want those to, you know, to to, to evaporate or uh, to volatilize. So, no, no, VOC has not been something that has come up. Um, the silicone side of things, uh, maybe early on we might have had some, some questions around that, but no. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. I think I've been told I need to get the heck off the stage and have a great day. Be safe.